So please, um, Hugh, I'd like to pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Let me just pull up some slides and hopefully this will work. And tell me if you can see a deck. Yes, we can. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. And I'm going to uh, try in less than 15 minutes to give you the underpinnings of why this statement was made in 2009 and why, despite a COVID pandemic, it remains true today. And in fact, that threat is dramatically worse, even than we stated it then. Um, let's see, maybe the next slide, there we go. So as you've heard, I chair the Lancet Countdown. This was being Wellcome Trust funded actually from the outset. So our first Lancet commissions in 2008 and nine were followed by two more. Um, largely when we, what we first reported in 2009, um, the editor of the Lancet and the Wellcome came back and said, everything you predicted to happen, we thought you were talking about a hundred years, but we've had it all in the last three. So we need some action on this. And this is where the countdown came from. It's a very substantial collaboration now of 38 institutions across a raft of different countries, um, ranging from China and Iran to Britain and the US with some uh, non-governmental organizations such as the World Meteorological Organization and the World Health Organization. And it produces a report every year on where we are, the threats to, chain, uh, to climate, uh, climate change to health, what we're doing, where the money's moving and the political and social action in that sphere. So I'm going to rapidly give you the scale of the problem and that's best done in, I think, the lifespan of a grandparent. So here we are from 92 years ago, moving forwards to today. So believe it or not, 92 years ago was the first air conditioning unit ever invented appeared. That was in 1929. I, I am old enough to remember the jet set, those monstrously rich people who could afford to buy an aeroplane ticket. Because remember, before 1952, no one could buy a commercial jet ticket in the world because there were no commercial jet flights being made. Only 48 years ago, the world's first conventional modern plastic bottle was produced. Strange, isn't it? That was 1973. Again, those of us old enough remember recycling glass bottles and going around to next door neighbours to go and get them for that purpose. And it was only 21 years ago the first smartphone appeared. But just look at the scale of change. From no aircon units at all 92 years ago, there's one sold every six seconds now with nearly two billion in use. And they're now accounting for 7% of global electricity use. The first commercial jet ticket, no one at all was flying in 1951 on a commercial jet ticket, but just before COVID, 142 people were boarding every single second. And from no one buying a plastic bottle in 1973, we now sell 15,000 or more every second, with 480 billion being used every year. Same for smartphones, none 21 years ago, now 47 a second being sold. And all of these take a huge amount of energy to make, and a lot of them a huge amount of energy to run if they've got running costs. So just think about those plastic bottles. If you are, and I hope you don't, someone who buys a plastic litre bottle of water, the energy cost in terms of oil used to make the bottle, extract the water and ship it, is a third of a litre of oil per bottle. And I invite you again to look at the number of bottles we're using every year. The net result is we're burning a lot of fossil fuel. This was um, the year before COVID, what we were burning. And that releases a vast amount of greenhouse gas in the form of carbon dioxide into a very thin atmosphere. If you were to roll all the Earth's atmosphere into a sphere at standard temperature and pressure, it would be represented by that pink ball over the globe on the right. The atmosphere is very small. And if you put huge amounts of greenhouse gas into a very thin atmosphere, you get a massive rise. So here are the cyclical changes in global CO2 concentrations over the last 800,000 years. But look what has happened in the last 50 years. This vertical line to the right. And look how fast we're still changing. So only a couple of years ago, in May 2018, we were at 412 parts per million. First of May this year, we were at 419. Things are not slowing down in any way, shape or form. Those greenhouse gases let shortwave radiation in and they trap longwave radiation. Global warming sounds very nice, doesn't it? It's not global warming, it's atmospheric energy gain. And that energy gain means we've added the equivalent of 2.8 billion Hiroshima bombs of energy to our atmosphere since 1998. And we're adding currently around five more every single second. That's energy that we're adding that is not escaping back into space. And if you add, energy to an atmosphere, you get weather. 
which is why you get more and more extreme weather and more and more extreme weather events. You also get sea level rise, uh, that graph to the left, we're now going up by five millimetres a year, so a centimetre every two years of sea level rise. And this is not going to be a slow linear rise. Even were it a slow linear rise, a large number of people will be affected uh, in the lifetimes of a child born today. So on the right, we see um, in that lifetime, a third of a billion people will be underwater quite quickly, potentially two thirds of a billion. And remember, a billion people live within 10 metres of today's um, of today's high tide mark. People will move a long time before they're underwater. And of course, it isn't as simple as just drawing a line around 10, you know, uh, a sea level rise because land erodes and collapse in, collapses in uh, and the sea will advance much more quickly. And furthermore, these estimates of sea level rise are gross underestimates almost certainly for reasons we will discuss shortly. It's not just the steady rise in temperatures and the steady rise in sea levels or accelerating rise, it's these extreme weather events. So this is Carbon Brief's mapping of extreme weather events in recent years, where we know statistically there is a certain attribution to climate change. And that's the majority of them in the orange dots there. Um, much of the minority are where we're not sure or there's no human influence. And you can see that just in the case of fires. This was Australia in the winter just before, or our winter just before COVID hit. These massive fires, you'll remember the pictures, um, where we've lost a huge amount of ecosystem. But it's not just Australia. Siberia, this was July 2019 when these fires started, and they're burning through peat. So you won't be able to put them out because they're burning underground. And even by July 2020, an area half the size of Greece was a fire. It's the same in the Amazon. And these thermal fronts where you've got smoke rising steeply uh, leads to lightning strikes ahead of the advancing flame front which starts more fires downwind even, uh, as well as upwind of, of fire fronts. Angola, Congo, Central Africa, the same, vast numbers of fires, we don't hear about them. I was on a call yesterday with the public health minister for the Caribbean in Trinidad, and their tropical rainforests are ablaze as well, as they are in Indonesia, as they are in California, and as we now hear they are in um, Canada. I don't have time to take you through the complex, complex mapping of uh, climate change impacts on health, but let's gallop through them quickly. Um, you get changes in pollen season, spring comes earlier, more pollen density, uh, different allergenics. You get increases in ground level ozone, you get heat waves and fires producing um, particulates, all of which conspire to produce respiratory disease and with those particulates actually also stroke, heart attack, peripheral vascular disease and so forth. We know that with the heat waves, droughts reduce physical work capacity. It's impossible to work in very high temperatures um, and flooding would together with ecosystem collapse leads to loss of crops and starvation at biblical scale. We know that flooding um, produce, uh, washing out sewerage, but also washing down, for instance, nitrates into chlorinated water produces chemical poisoning along with algal blooms. We know you get bacterial diseases increasingly frequently leading to diarrhea. You have mental health problems related to these. You get increased in vector-borne diseases, schistosomiasis, uh, or for instance, um, dengue fever and malaria, because temperatures rise, which means that the vectors can live in greater areas. You get greater rainfall, because as temperatures rise, you evaporate more water, and that's got to come out somewhere. And warmer and wetter means better mosquito dwelling habitats. And in the heat, they feed faster, breed faster, and the parasites replicate in their stomachs more quickly. We get poverty, poverty, loss of habitation and starvation. And those things lead to mass migration. Uh, and I quote um, Jack Straw and actually in William Hague, both of whom use the same phrase, uh, talking about mass migration on a biblical scale. And when you get that, you get conflict. So these are the really big ticket items in my view. It's going to be the mass migration and war in the first instance. And remember the Pentagon, not exactly the most liberal left-wing organization, I would have thought, as far back as 2003, we're talking about climate change producing a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. They're talking about billions of people dying, and we're now talking about that happening now, not in future generations, but to our own generation. And this concerns me because we've now spent five years of the Lancet countdown tracking changes in climate, changes in energy, changes in finance, deployment of technologies that might help, the impacts on health and the political action in the space. 
And essentially, so far, we just report every year that things are getting worse. Um, there isn't a sign at all, at all, of any significant change. Because far from having reduced CO2 emissions, they continue to increase and they rebounded after a 6.8% or 6.3% reduction in the year of COVID, and they're now back up to higher than they were before. When on the representative concentration pathway known as RCP 8.5, that was the worst case scenario. This is the one where it's sort of end of days type scenario. And that's the track we're currently on. We've not reduced our CO2 emissions at all. Worse than that, a paper published on the 18th of June by NASA and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration shows that we have now triggered at least one positive feedback loop. So we're melting ice, which means it doesn't reflect energy back into space. And you've now got dark ocean soil beneath absorbing heat at the same time as greenhouse gas concentrations going up, driving more ice melt. And the net result is the energy gain I showed you with those Hiroshima bombs has doubled in only 14 years. And anyone who understands physics will know it will double again in less than 14 years, probably a lot less than 14 years, and a great deal less if we keep adding more CO2. That will then trigger potentially other feedback loops, and they've already been triggered. We're releasing methane hydrates from melting tundra, methane being more than 90 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide over a 20 year cycle, and over an 80 year cycle, 23 times as powerful. So we're triggering these positive feedbacks, which we can't reverse. And let me remind you that as we heard, from the introduction, this is happening on the background of humanity having destroyed its own ecosystems. Even without climate change, we've led to eight species becoming extinct every hour, and we've lost 70% of all vertebrates on the planet in the last 50 years alone. This was the leaked data from the USCCC. So this was the scientific report that's due out next year. It gets politically filtered, so it won't say things like this because um, the politicians get their hands on it. But this is the quote from the scientists currently. Species extinction, widespread disease, unlivable heat, ecosystem collapse and cities menaced by rising seas will become painfully obvious before a child born today turns 30. And remember what a child born today is already experiencing if they live in Canada or California or Australia, and it's only going to get worse. The conclusion we came to with the first Lancet countdown was this. Essentially, there's plenty enough money. The technology is there to solve the problem. We just need people to move money. And by political, it's a small P. It's people like you with influence on others and the funds that you hold. This is about moving the money. How much money? Not a great deal, actually. Uh, technically, it's thought that we could solve the entire climate problem, decarbonize the economy with a spend around 2.38 trillion dollars a year, which is less than is actually spent on maintaining fossil fuel infrastructure and only about two and a half percent of global domestic product. So it's a lot of money, but it's not that much money. Let's see, though, what's actually been spent on the other side. In the last year, the world's spent nearly 12 trillion dollars on addressing COVID. There's a stimulus package of nearly two trillion dollars, so enough to fix the climate problem for a year, being spent just by Joe Biden's administration. Now let's look at what's happening with the agreement from the Paris deal, looking for a, only a paltry tenth of a, a well, one, essentially $100 billion being sought. And that's for adaptation, not for mitigation. How much has actually been committed? Eight billion. Nothing is happening here. And I took this photograph some years ago when I was up to COP15. One of the children, now one of the teenagers, you have been negotiating all my life. You cannot tell me you need more time. We have we are absolutely out of time. And everyone on this call, I encourage you, is to think what you can do, not for your great great grandchildren, but for yourself and your children alive today. Because in the coming few years, we are in terrible, terrible trouble. And this is about equity. It's not about international equity. This is about intergenerational equity. It's about what we, as a group of adults, leave to the children of the world. And we have absolutely no right, in my view, to have squandered the environmental capital we have and let our children burn as a result. So that's my challenge for you today, is what form that action is going to take. And with that, I'm going to stop talking, stop sharing, and hand back to our chair. Thank you. So um, we can open up for questions now. I have a couple that I would just love to ask to, to help kick off. 
Um, we did have a question early on in the chat box, which aligns with one of mine, which was, what are the key levers? Um, someone specifically asked about the key political levers, uh, particularly those that relate to health, but I'd love to expand that um, beyond politics. So I think I'll, I'll start by asking um, Hugh um, and Gatinji that, and then maybe we can go to Sonia and Madeline's responses. It's a really good question because it gets to the nub of why nothing at all has happened. And it's taken me a long time to work it out. Um, and it's, as I put in the chat box, really, this, this it, you'll understand tessellated structures. So those are structures that are symmetrical and interlock, and they're very, very, very strong. Uh, they're used in engineering. And you've got those in a country. So if you take Britain, you've got a government that until recently, when the youth started making it a political issue, and the Conservatives decided they actually might need to pander to it, until then, um, it was a vote loop. User. No one in any election ever mentioned climate change or environment because that wasn't what mattered. It was about taxes and it was about health services or education. So they weren't going to move. Businesses were saying, well, we're, we can't do anything. Um, if the government legislate for this, then we've got to go for the cheapest thing. We've got shareholders to serve. So we're, we're neutered without legislation. And the general public would say, well, we can't do anything because if the politicians won't create the framework and the businesses won't give us the stuff to do, we're, we're disempowered. So no one did anything. And internationally, the government, as ours did, said, we'll only move as quickly as anyone else does. Because if we, we, we could disadvantage our own country and businesses would say, well, we're not going to take action in Britain because some are just offshore. And the people in Britain would say, well, we can't do anything because what's happening in India and China. So no one did anything at all. So the question is, where is that leverage? And to me, it starts with business, because when it comes down to it, it's all about money. When I say business, I mean finance, you, the people listening. It's about the money. The money moves, everything changes. Businesses change, the public follow. Businesses make it clear that that's what they want. They make the first moves. It gives the politicians the um, permissive environment in which to act. But if businesses and people wait for government, nothing but nothing will happen, which is why the graph of CO2 emissions hasn't even flickered with a single international negotiation. And we're on the 26th one now. So my message is the leverage is actually in your own hands. It's about you and the people you know to get together and move together. Move the monies away from the fossil fuel and the bad stuff. That sends a signal to market. Move it into the good stuff that sends a signal to market. If the pension funds and so forth start moving, as we've seen with coal, it rapidly becomes unprofitable. So that, that would be my message. It's about moving the money. But we did have a, we had a question early on about the, the co-benefits of climate change policy, the win-wins in terms of health. Um, could you talk a little bit about more about those? Hugh, you already expanded them on, on them in the chat box, but perhaps you've got some more thoughts. Yeah, so it's, it's a very good point um, because do the dollar rules and uh, companies and businesses don't do anything unless there's profit in it. And um, one of the issues around the expenditure on things that protect the planet are that they happen to be very, very good for the health. So Andy Haynes did a lot of that work and again, funded by the, uh, by the Wellcome Trust again in the report in I think 2008, nine. Um, showing that of course, if you walk and cycle, for instance, rather than driving a car, there's less CO2 in the atmosphere. If you eat locally produced vegetable based products as opposed to imported flown in things or red meat, you also, you know, red meat, for instance, you save greenhouse gas emissions from the flights, but you also save the greenhouse gas emissions from belching cows with methane, which is, as we've heard, 23 times more powerful greenhouse gas and CO2. So it's very good for climate, but it's also incredibly good for health. So those two measures together reduce the risk of stroke coronary vascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, breast cancer, bowel cancer, mild to moderate depression, Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, you know, diabetes, obesity, the list goes on. And actually you get a very, very large amount of money back almost immediately um, in health economic gain because you're not spending money on treating the woman with breast cancer or treating the person with osteoporotic fractures. And those people are still contributing actively to their economies. So it turns out you get a lot of the money back and the coupling is really, really tight as it is a lot for health. Um, so lots of reasons to act. And yet we somehow seem to have this false dichotomy, don't we? That we have to have a growing economy to, for people to be healthy. And actually it doesn't matter if you throw people on the fire along the way, because like with climate change or pollution, you've just got to have an economy to fund the health service. 
And I put in the chat box, if you look at my work in intensive care, it's 3,000 patients, 3,000 pounds per patient per day. And nearly all of that disease would go away if you took away alcohol, drugs, tobacco, obesity, poor diets, lack of exercise, urban air pollution, and so forth. I reckon of our 15 beds, 14 would be shut. We'd save a fortune and have a happier, healthier nation. Um, so we need to start stitching together government departments. It's about time health wasn't put head to head with climate, head to head with business or treasury or head to head with education. There's a unified set of policies that are good for the health of everybody. They just happen to also be very good for climate. Thanks, Hugh. I mean, I think there's something here about the fact that poor health, Ill, poor mental health, um, climate change are symptoms of something under you know there's an underlying cause of all of these things and the deeper you go the further upstream you go the more you address all of them at once let's just think of the covid pandemic now most of these spillover events we've had three in 17 years and five in total in over in the last few decades very often are because huge amounts of humans are being pushing into ecosystems where they shouldn't be depleting those ecosystems, causing predation that otherwise wouldn't happen and causing viruses to jump from species to other species where they shouldn't be like humans. And then we have 142 people boarding a jet plane a second, spreading it all over the world. So these links between environment and health are very strong and we just sometimes ignore them. 